Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Jose, for inviting me to uh, talk about how can we select or refine our selection uh, in adjuvant therapy in stage two colon cancer. Um, it's a very short block on adjuvant therapy. You see, there's a lot of focus nowadays on palliative therapy, but I do believe we have some advances that were made in you know, how to refine the patient population for the treatment in stage two and stage three. In stage three, will later be covered by Thierry Andre. So first of all, I think we all have the impression that stage two patients do so much better than stage three patients, but when you look at the AJCC version seven classification and publication in 2009, which really set our kind of TNN classification, you can see that stage two, some patients with stage two disease, in particular the T4, T4B tumors, actually do worse than some patients with stage three disease. So that is just a prognostic implication. Of course, we like to translate this into treatment recommendations. The question is, who should be treated in, in stage two disease with adjuvant therapy and with what kind of adjuvant therapy? And the other point is, who should not be treated in stage three disease with adjuvant therapy or what kind of treatment do we need? Do all patients with stage three disease need oxaplatin-based therapy, for instance? This is something that Thierry will cover later. So what do we use as basis for recommendation that patients should be treated in stage two with adjuvant therapy? And the only really randomized study that we have, which we all cite, are these, the Quasar or the Quasar 1 study, which is kind of an historic study. And the problem that we see here is, first of all, the overall survival difference after five years was marginally marginal at best, you know, 3%. And we know nowadays that not all of these patients were actually truly stage 2 patients because the yield of lymph nodes, for instance, in the study was not optimal cons uh, considering that we now have a lymph node threshold of about 10 or 12, you know, that we consider a standard of care to identify patients with stage 3 disease or stage 2 disease. So this result here is contaminated by, potentially contaminated by patients with stage 3 disease, which were included here. Now, the, we have data for oxaplatin-based therapy in stage two and stage three disease. As you know, the Mosaic study uh, set the new standard of care for stage three disease. But in this patient population, 40% per, uh, of patients were actually stage two cancers. And in this setting, they identified a so-called high-risk stage two uh, colon cancers based on clinical and pathological features. And I think the most important ones were T4 lesions and less than 10 in mosaic or 12 lymph nodes nowadays. And then some secondary uh, prognostic implication like obstruction perforation, lymphovascular invasion, undifferentiated histology. The most important ones are characterized here in red. It's T4 stage and the number of lymph nodes that were resected. Now, these were the clinical risk factors that cl classify tumors at high risk. When you look at the effect of oxaplatin-based therapy on disease-free survival here, you can see the delta for high-risk stage th uh, two patient in five-year disease-free survival of 7.2% was very similar to the stage three uh, tumors, 7.5%. Having said that, this is disease-free survival. The oxaplatin-based therapy did not translate into any improvement in overall survival, even not in high-risk stage two patients. You can see here now this is overall survival, difference in stage two, zero, 0 0.1, and in stage three, 4.4. That is 4.4%. That's what we can achieve. So the standard of care since then has been, if you consider st a treatment for stage two patients in, um, in, in its adjuvant therapy, use a fluoroprimid and a single agent, at least for the majority of patients, if you look at overall survival benefit. Now the question is, is a disease-free survival difference that you saw before, 7.2%, is this a value in itself? So I believe there's some opening for adjuvant therapy with an oxaplatin-based regimen in high-risk stage two cancers. But if you look at it from an overall survival perspective, and I borrowed this slide and modified it from Jeff Meyerhardt's a very elegant uh, discussion last year at ASCA when he discussed part of the idea collaboration studies, when we look at of 100 patients here, who gets cured in stage two with adjuvant therapy, probably the 3.5% of patients here, uh, 3%, three patients here with fluoroprimidine, and perhaps one patient with an oxaplatin-based regimen. That's, however, for all patients combined, and you can easily see, of course, stage two is not 
all homogeneous in stage two. I already showed you earlier that they're high-risk tumors which have much poorer prognosis, in particular the T4 tumors. So, but the challenge is really who should be treated, what's the treatment benefit ratio, the outcomes benefit ratio in these patients. So what about molecular parameters? When we are stuck with clinical pathologic parameters, can we do better? Are there single markers or signatures that can help us? And you know, there's actually, when you look at markers and markers that can guide treatment in stage two, treatment decision in adjuvant therapy, there are actually two kinds of markers. One marker would be excluding patients who have excellent prognosis anyway from adjuvant therapy. And in stage two, there's one marker we already have and we already use, which is deficient mismatch repair, or MSI high. These patients do very well, and Dan Sargent's publication here in JCO showed that untreated patients actually did even better than treated patients, although this might be a little bit confounded by sample size, et cetera. But when you look at these data here, there's clearly no need to treat patients with adjuvant therapy if you have an MMRD, mismatch repair deficient, MSR high stage two cancer. These patients do well anyway. Whether there's some resistance to fluoroprimidine, which has been postulated from preclinical and clinical data, uh, remains to be seen. But really, these patients do not need any therapy. And this has been validated actually as a prognostic indicator in other studies like PETAC3. You can see in a multivariate analysis here, the two factors that really showed to be uh, were associated with outcome were T stage T4 versus T3, T4 being worse than T3, in particular MSI high versus MSS with a hazard ratio of 0.28, meaning a 72% risk reduction if patients had a mismatch repair deficient cancer compared to MSS, highly statistically significant. So that's one of the factors where we identify patients who should not be treated, which can guide our therapy. Now, unfortunately, this mismatch repair deficiency is only, uh, only accounts for about 10, 15, perhaps 15 percent of patients. So in 2010, um, this was the algorithm I commonly showed our fellows and in educational sessions, and I said, okay, if you have resected colon cancer stage three, the default is probably Falfox or Kpox, and there are some patients, elderly patients, who might not need oxaplatin-based therapy. This is now being modified with the duration question, of course. For stage two, it's a little bit more complicated, and you know, I looked at, you know, are there high-risk factors, T4 or less than 12 lymph nodes? Those patients are high-risk, and if you believe that disease-free survival improvement is is a value in itself, those patients might actually benefit from an oxaplatin based regimen. However, if there are no high risk factors, mismatch repair deficiency really identifies patients who are low risk and should not be treated. Now, unfortunately, a lot of patients are in this intermediate risk group, and the question is what are we going to do with them? And marker signatures? Could marker signatures help us move these patients into different categories? Now, Way back when, about a decade ago, we did have a first attempt at a marker signature with this Oncotype DX approach, data from the Quesa study that looked at separating patients out into T4, T3 mismatch repair proficient, and T3 mismatch repair deficient. And they looked at recurrence scores based on a gene signature approach. And you can see here that the outcome, this is the risk of recurrence at three years, really dependent on these three different categories, but also the recurrence score. It also highlights again, when you look at overall for the recurrence score in general, that T3 MMR deficient tumors, the Lynch syndrome-like tumors, they have excellent prognosis overall, highlighting exactly what I showed you earlier. Now, unfortunately, with this marker signature, the curves between these different uh, categories, high risk, low risk, intermediate group, you know, didn't really separate out very well. You can see here that the recurrence risk, you know, over three years distinguished patients between 12, 18, and 22 percent of risk of recurrence. That is spreading it out somewhat but I don't think really convincing enough for us to use this in clinical practice, in particular since we know that in contrast to the same assay or similar assay in breast cancer, it did not have any predictive implication, just the prognostic implication that we saw here. So this was the first foray that we had into molecular marker signatures based treatment decision helpers, tools to guide us in our treatment for stage two cancers. And I don't think the initial approach was very helpful and was adopted very widely. 
Now, we have to talk about circulating tumor DNA. This is kind of a common theme that has been kind of run through this conference and prior conference. And, you know, Peter Gibbs yesterday from Australia showed you some of these slides here, which I think are very instrumental, also leading toward the design of ongoing clinical trials, which will show us exactly whether we have tools at hand that can refine the patient population that should be treated with adjuvant therapy in stage two cancers. We don't need to talk about circulating tumor DNA. If you were here yesterday, you already saw these slides here. Very elegant study conducted in Australia with the help of the Hopkins group. Uh, 250 subjects stage two colon cancers. They did perform a mutation-based uh, circulating tumor DNA analysis, blood collection after the surgery. And then physicians were allowed to treat patients the way they would like to treat patients based on conventional risk factors along the lines what I showed you earlier. And the results were stunning. When you look at the oncotype DX separation of curves, this is a far cry from what you see here, which really separates these two different patient populations, positive circulating tumor DNA, negative circulating tumor DNA out very nicely. These were patients not treated with chemotherapy. Then there is a clinically high-risk tumor group. These patients were some of them at least were treated with chemotherapy. And it's a little bit concerning to me that even in those patients who were uh, treated with uh, chemotherapy on the right-hand side, that still if you had circulating tumor DNA positivity, every single patient recurred. It's a very strong prognostic factor which can hopefully guide us in, in our therapy. Now, just to give you one point, only 10% of patients stage two disease actually had positive circulating tumor DNA after the surgery. But if you look at the multivariate analysis, similar to what I showed you earlier with a PETAC-3 study, the presence of postoperative circulating tumor DNA status was highly statistically significant associated with, re with recurrence with a hazard ratio of 28. And that's probably as strong as it gets. And uh, Dr. Gibbs already showed you the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, which is exactly what we need in order to design tools that can guide treatments in the stage two, potentially in the stage three setting, whether or not we use adjuvant therapy. Now, how do we utilize these markers of minimal residual disease? Because that's really what it is, markers of minimal residual disease. And how do we, what considerations do we have for adjuvant therapy? So number one is we can use it to treat where we'd normally not treat in stage two disease. I believe, you know, when you look at the data that I just showed you, that we can identify patients who are at high risk for tumor recurrence. The question is, of course, does chemotherapy then work, and can we cure a patient which we, with circulating tumor DNA present, or are these patients beyond the point of return? There are some anecdotal data that we can actually influence the clinical course in these patients, but I think we need more data, prospective data, to really validate that. On the other hand, and this is more complex, is not treat patients where we would normally treat, like in stage three tumors. If you have no circulating tumor DNA and you're very sure that this is really what the, uh, that there is no residual disease, can you eliminate chemotherapy? Can you completely forego on any adjuvant therapy? And I can tell you, each of these settings have ethical challenges really strong ethical challenges. And I can tell you from the design of the intergroup trial, which is starting right now in the United States, where we look at the kind of prospective, prospectively collected circulating tumor DNA patients, and some patients where, where we actually release the information and use the information to allocate these patients to treatment versus no treatment arm compared to standard of care where we would not share this information about circulating tumor DNA, and then allow physicians to tr choose their treatment independent of the circulating tumor DNA approach. This design has been heavily discussed with the input of patient advocates. Is it ethically relevant and, and sound right now at this point in time to not share the information about circulating tumor DNA post-op with patients, and withhold the information, and run this study in order to validate the important the prognostic implication of the uh, circulating tumor DNA? And important point here, does the clearing rate of circulating tumor DNA over time with longitudinal assessment actually correspond with a higher rate of cure when we use adjuvant therapy? Actually, a similar trial is ongoing in Australia right now, the dynamic study, which is already, has already 270 out of 450 patients. Very similar design. 
uh, two to one randomization biomarker driven group where the circulating tumor DNA analysis is being used to allocate treatment or no treatment and this all will be compared to the standard group where, where the uh, circulating tumor DNA information is not being shared. Again, you can easily see that this has ethical implications in both ways and we'll hear more of the ethical implications probably when we talk about withholding therapy, uh, adjuvant therapy for stage three cancers. So in conclusion, you know, there's been a, lo a lot of dormancy actually over the last decade in terms of new advances in adjuvant therapy. We've seen some data last year about shorter duration of treatment with the push toward Cape platin based therapy, and Terry will probably talk about this. The IDEA group has some studies which included stage two patients in the analysis of the stage two subgroup is actually ongoing. We'll see more data at future meetings. Um, I think we have molecular defined uh, subgroups already with in stage two and stage three later MSI high BRAF mutant tumors might actually warrant specific interventions. And again, studies are ongoing or in planning. And I think, really, you know, the innovations in molecular technology, molecular technology identifying patients with minimal residual disease, whatever that means clinically and for the therapeutic potential to really cure these patients with positive circulating tumor DNA, these are uh, in the studies which are ongoing and probably the next frontier of really individualizing uh, adjuvant therapy for stage 2 colon cancer. Thank you very much.